Hi, Anna. How are you? Thank you for coming. Um, the unmute button is all the way on. There it is. Hi, can you hear me? How are you? Good. So I'm really bad with technology. So that's why I asked to be here a little bit uh, ahead of schedule. So and I'm actually going to send you my presentation by email because I, I couldn't figure out where I should load it. Yeah, yeah. As I explained in the email, we have to make a link out of it. So yeah, if you send it now, I okay. can yes. uh, really quick. We still have um, some minutes. I can really quick um, turn it into a link. How was your week? All good? <laughs> uh, a lot of work, but that, that's just normal. So let me see. So it's a, uh, it's a little bit big. Are you gonna upload it as a, a Google Drive file? Yes. Um. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, and share the link. Um. I can show you. Can you? Do you want to send me the link? And the settings have to be on. Everyone with the link um is allowed to view. Mm -hmm. So you go to settings and then there's usually restricted and then you change it to oh yeah, I can I can also do it. You just send it to me, so and where where do we see the present? Yeah, I'll show you in a okay. second. Once I have it as a link. Okay. Hello Dr. Santos. I'm Jamie. It's so nice to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really happy to be talking about this work. I actually am as well. I when I was having a look at um James Tour's uh YouTube channel, I actually saw the what we're gonna be talking about today. It was only a small video, but I was absolutely fascinated with it. So I'm very, very grateful you have the time to come with us and talk about this because it's really exciting and interesting. So you're telling me there's a YouTube video about this? I I have no idea. Yeah. Uh it's not a video, so okay. we just so this this room is recorded and um so we uh we share then the recorded file for people no, that didn't make it to um, to this room today right now because they are um, in Asia. We have a lot of people also in Asia and they are asleep right now and in Australia. Um, so they can then somehow I cannot um, is the file some. OK, let me try again. Oh, there it is. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let's try and see. Uh, let me know. Uh, please try to click on it. Let me know if it works, everyone. No, it's it's still restricted the file. <clears throat> um, if you go on the settings. Uh, you can change the settings to if you press on share um, that it's uh, sh not restricted that everyone can access. So I should go on share. Uh, share.
Uh, do you know how to how to change the settings or? I just got a request to share, uh, and I shared it, and now I'm gonna try to. So I should open the file on Google and then share, right? And share with who? Uh, so yeah, on the share there's restricted. Do you see the uh, sign uh, restricted? Mm -hmm. And then you can change the restriction to anyone with the link may view. So okay, I just did that. Thank you. Okay, cool. Let's try to go to the link. Yeah, now it works. Thank you. Perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, already um, 101, so I think we can start. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and of course a special thank you to Anna. Um, thank you so much for, you know, making the account and coming here. <laughs> I know it's yeah. a lot of struggle <laughs> to go through. I can do science, I cannot do technology, so. <laughs> so it's a special honor um so yeah we really appreciate it. and before we start let me introduce you uh to the audience a little bit um so um anna um did her um uh license um her bachelor and master's degree at the uh, university of the vedo in Portugal and um, she uh, did then later on her PhD in microbiology in um, the University of Aveiro in Portugal. And um, then later she did her um, first postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the um, uh, Faculty of Medicine in Paris. And later she, um, received the Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellow Award um, and did her uh, postdoc at Rice University in James Tours Lab. And um, yeah, it's a great honor having you here today. And um, Anna is uh, passionate, passionate about understanding the role of environmental and genetic factors in bacterial physiology and stress resistant resistance and um, yeah she's also interested in how these environmental factors uh, affect the physiology diversity and evolution of uh, marine bacterial populations and um, yeah she she's sharing her amazing research here with us today Just a quick update. I think you find you found an old soul file online because I haven't updated it in a while. So that was work that I did several years ago. <laughs> I haven't done environmental microbiology in a little while, but I, I'm still passionate about it for sure. But I'm more interested right now in um, fighting, fighting antibiotic resistance and fighting antimicrobial resistance in general and just try to to help in that fight so uh would you like is this gonna be a little bit of an interactive talk or should uh, should i start with a presentation um yeah it's really up to you um could you i don't know for me you're a little bit um it sounds like you're far away from the microphone is there a way to um, make it a little, or is it just for me? Maybe it's just on my side. Victoria, what do no, you? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing yes, it as well. It's yeah. a bit, yeah, it's a bit soft. Okay, can you hear me better now? Mm, it's still a bit soft. I, I don't know if it, if you have noise cancelling headphones that might be making it a little softer, um, or proximity to this your microphone could help. Yeah. It, uh... Ooh. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Bravo. It's, Thank you. It's inside my mouth, so that's the best <laughs> I can do. 
<laughs> so, okay. thank you. Uh, Okay, if that's if you guys don't mind, please I will start with the presentation. Um, but please interrupt me at any time because some things are like basic to me, but I forget that not everyone is a biologist or a microbiologist, okay? So you just go ahead and ask whatever questions you have while I'm talking. So don't be afraid to interrupt, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, the title of the paper is Light Activated Molecular Machines Are Fast Acting Broad Spectrum Antibacterials That Target the Membrane. But before we get into it, I think it's really important to um, try to understand the motivation. Why are we um, trying to find new web antibacterials? Are aren't the antibiotics that we have good enough? So I don't know if you guys are aware of the problem of antibiotic resistance, which, is, which has been called the silent pandemic. So are you aware that antibiotic resistance is a problem? Yes, mm -hmm. I think we all are, yep. Good, so uh, I think that over the last two years we very reasonably have forgotten about this problem. This, but this is something, this is a crisis that has been happening for a while now. And it is a big public health threat to, um, to not only the health, but also the, the safety and the security of food and even for homeland security, it's considered a big problem. And so much so that uh, in 2019, antibiotic resistance was the third leading cause of death in the world. And resistance to antibiotics caused even more deaths than, for instance, HIV and malaria. So it is really, really, really a big problem. And while antibiotics are becoming less able to kill common pathogens. We have all become so reliant on them, sometimes we don't even recognize how important they are in our lives. But uh, indeed, antibiotics have caused a major shift in our population. And since their discovery, it is estimated they extended the lifespan of, of the human population by as much as 20 years. So they have really made a, a dramatic impact in our health. And therefore, antibiotic resistance can make such a big impact as well. And if we don't have new tools to fight antibiotic resistance, as much as 10 million lives per year might be in danger by 2050, which is not that far away. So when we talk an about antibiotic resistance, what is it? So it's the inability to kill bacteria with an antibiotic that used to work. So maybe 10 years ago, we were able to kill a bacterial infection with an antibiotic. And nowadays, we can no, no longer do so because due to the selective pressure exerted by antibiotic overuse and misuse, bacteria are very tricky and very quote unquote smart and they have developed resistance to these antibiotics. And they also have the ability to spread this resistance from one bacteria to another. So while re antibiotic resistance continues to increase around the world, and now we have been able to detect resistance to every single antibiotic that we use in the clinic, we haven't seen the same increase in the number of antibiotics available to use. It's not like every week there's a new antibiotic, not at all. In a, it's been uh, about four decades maybe since a new uh, antibiotic that acts by a new mechanism of action has been introduced in the market. And the problem with antibiotic research is that it's not financially viable, and it doesn't make much sense from an economic stance. Pharmaceutical companies prefer to invest their money into a drug that the person has to use 
for a long period of time. Let's imagine a, a cholesterol controlling drug, for instance, that the person has used for several years, instead of antibiotic that a person has used for a week, let's say. So we have seen the major pharmaceutical companies just abandoning antibiotic research and development. And among the few antibiotics that are in development, they are simply slight chemical modifications from the existing antibiotics. Now, this is not a good strategy because, like I said before, bacteria are quote-unquote smart. If they already have developed resistance to one antibiotic, the fact that we make a new one that is just slightly different, bacteria will develop resistance to that one too. So the resistance mechanisms are already inside the bacteria armamentarium. They, throughout the evolution, they have accumulated these tools to be able to deal with any type of challenge from antibacterial molecules because we need to think that most antibiotics, they are not new to bacteria. Most are used for defensive purposes because bacteria live in communities, so they use antibiotics to fight one another to compete for resources. So during this process, the bacteria that produces an antibiotic has also had to develop the defenses to withstand it and kill the competition. So this all makes sense. Now, if the, con the, the conventional route to develop new antibiotics is exhausted, we need to come up with unconventional ways to fight bacteria. We cannot keep using the same tools. And in fact, uh, we are no longer able to find antibiotics just as easily uh, as in the beginning of the antibiotic research and development in the 1940s. So we need to think outside of the box. And that's where antimicrobial nanomaterials come up. So antimicrobial nanomaterials are materials within the dimensions of the nanometer. And what they have that is so special is that at the nanometer scale, their properties are completely different from materials in bulk state. And one of these properties that they have and that they can be used for is to kill bacteria. If we look at the dimension of a nano nanomaterial versus a bacteria, nanoparticles are much smaller than the bacteria, so they can easily or more easily contact and interact with the bacteria and either enter the bacteria and interact with the intercellular processes inside the bacteria. And compared to conventional antibiotics, which normally have a fixed, uh, a fixed target in the cell, generally it's one enzyme or one process, these materials exert a multimodal mechanism of action. That is, they, kill, they attack bacteria in se several different angles. They not, not only perforate the membrane, they can also elicit the production of RFS. And when the bacteria is under attack from so many different angles, it's very hard for them to be able to develop resistance from these different types of attacks. It's not like with antibiotics where they have one target, so one mutation can be enough to confer resistance to the antibiotics, not with antimicrobial nanomaterials. On the other hand, uh, like I said before, bacteria have been dealing with antibiotics for ages, ever since the dawn of bacteria, because it's a fighting tool for them, not with synthetic antimicrobials, not with synthetic antimicrobial nanomaterials. So the, they don't have the tools to fight these um, new materials in their toolbox. So that's why it's considered an unconventional approach that can be used to target the plight of antimicrobial resistance. And we are particularly interested in smart nanomaterials. So smart nanomaterials are materials that can be activated by a stimulus to exert 
a certain action. So for instance, in our case, we are particularly interested in studying light responsive nanomaterials because light is non-invasive, so we can apply it from the exterior and we can easily and remotely control it. So we can have a on-off antimicrobial uh, material and that exerts only the action that we want. In this case, the uh, um, uh, mechanical action when we apply the light source. And uh, the Tor lab has been developing the um, molecular nanomachine technology for a while now. They did a very amazing work uh, in 2017 where they described the first molecular machines that were able to drill through the membranes of cells and kill cancer cells. Uh, and later on, they even show that they were able to kill entire organisms using these nanomachines. But the problem with the, this first generation of nanomachines is that they were UV activated, which is obviously a limitation since we know that UV has very detrimental effects to the cell. It can cause cancer like we know, for instance. So in a second generation of nanomachines, we wanted to try to make them uh, activated by visible light. So and that's what our chemists colleagues managed to do. So they were able to modify the chemical structure of the molecules so, so that they were then activated by visible light. And we saw very promising results early on with these molecules in killing cancer cells. Again, uh, these molecules were able to drill through the cancer cell and kill it. And then we wonder, well, maybe we can use this visible light activated molecular machines to kill bacteria and antibiotic resistant bacteria. So and that's what I started doing when I arrived at Rice and at Tor Lab was to check if indeed these uh, nanomachines could be used as antibacterials. And I was very luck luck lucky to be able to collaborate with my co-author Leo that had a library of different visible light activated molecular machines already prepared when I arrived so I was able to start immediately screening these nanomachines against bacteria. And we saw that they were indeed extremely powerful and they could exert bacterial uh, action, bactericidal action, so they killed the bacteria within minutes. And they don't only kill one type of bacteria, so they are broad spectrum uh, antimicrobials. That, that means that they can kill different types of bacteria, both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, very easily. What we also saw is that these nanomachines could kill antibiotic-resistant bacteria. We tried this uh, in a particularly challenging uh, bacteria, which is called MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is the most common cause of infections in hospitals and is an important cause of death. And in 2019, it caused over 100,000 deaths. And it's very common to acquire in the hospital and the treatment options are very limited, but they were no match to our nanomachines. They could be easily killed with a nanomachine, no particular um, difficulty there, unlike other uh, antibiotics. Now, our nanomachines also had another interesting property, was their ability to, call to kill what we call resistant phenotypes. So when we talk about antibiotic resistance, we normally refer to mutations in the genome that can be passed to the progeny of the bacteria. But we also have what are called resistant phenotypes. So this is a resistance that is not encoded in the genome, but it's a physiological property of a bacteria or a community of bacteria. 
in two particularly important resistance phenotypes within the clinical setting are persister cells and biofilms. Now, what are persister cells? Let's imagine a population of bacteria. In every population of bacteria, we have a very small amount of, let's call it, weird, lazy bacteria that have a very slow metabolism for no particular reason. Genetically, they are just the same as their brethren, but they have a very slow metabolic rate. Now, when we apply an antibiotic that affects the metabolism of bacteria, these guys, because they have a slow metabolism, they are not killed by the antibiotic. So they are able to tolerate the antibiotic. They don't divide while the antibiotic is present. But when the antibiotic is removed, they start dividing again. Now this is different from the resistance. Resistant bacteria, they do divide in the presence of the antibiotic. Okay? And these persister cells, they are very troubling because they cannot be killed by the usual antibiotics that affect bacteria that are actively growing. For instance, antibiotics that target protein synthesis or cell wall synthesis. Since these bacteria are not growing or growing very slowly, they cannot be killed. Now, they do not pass this phenotype to the progeny, but they are a reservoir where mutations that cause resistance can arise, and that's why they are a problem. And they are very hard to eliminate, and they are also very hard to detect within the clinical setting because the pro protocols that are used within the diagnostic team of an hospital, for instance, they normally don't look for these persister cells. And they are sometimes important causes of treatment failure, for instance, in the case of tuberculosis, because they form uh, granules within the lungs of the patient that cannot be killed with conventional therapy. So, but they are no match, again, to our molecular machines. Our molecular machines don't care if a cell is dividing or not, so they could still just as easily be killed with our molecules, and we did this with different bacterial strains. Um, and like we saw with exponentially growing cells, persister cells are easily killed by our nanomachines. <coughs> then we looked at another important resistant phenotype, which are called biofilms. So biofilms are communities of cells embedded in a matrix of extracellular material, extracellular polymeric materia material that is kind of slimy and that acts as a barrier to conventional antibiotics that cannot cross the slime to get into the cells. On the other hand, the biofilm architecture makes it so that when one applies a tre an antibiotic treatment, the first layer of cells is easily killed, but then the antibiotic cannot reach the inner depths of the biofilm. And when the antibiotic therapy stops, these cells survive and can regrow a new biofilm. These are particularly important, for instance, in catheters, but also uh, in other um, biomedical materials where they can grow and they are very hard to eliminate. And we see that when we treated uh, mature biofilms with our visible light activated molecular machines, we could also detect a substantial reduction in the number of uh, cells within the biofilm, both uh, active and also a reduction in the mass of the slime, that is the biofilm biomass. So our nanomachines are able to some extent to penetrate the biofilm and reach the cells to kill them.
Now, in antibiotic research and development, an important thing that we need to make sure is that the new antibiotic that we are developing is not gonna lead to resistant development like all the others all the other antibiotics we are in clinic right now. So the antibiotic should not be easily prone to the development of resistance. And this can be mitigated, for instance, if an antibiotic targets several processes in the cell that are independent of each other. But this is not always easy to achieve, it needs to be verified. And if you can see on slide 11, this can be measured. One of the strategies is by repeatedly exp expo uh, exposing the cells to increasing amounts of our antimicrobial. And through time, what happens is that mutations will start to arise that confer a little bit of resistance to the antibiotic. And through time, this can lead to a substantial decrease in the sensitivity of the bacteria to the antibiotics. And as you can see in figure 13, with conventional antibiotics, this is something that arises very quickly. And in some antibiotics, within a couple of exposures, we start to see a decrease in the sensitivity of the bacteria to the antibiotics. But with our nanomachines, at least for the 20 cycles that we tried, we did not see the development of resistance. It's important to note that this doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. On the contrary, it will probably happen with enough time. But what we see here is that the development of resistance is not easy as with other conventional antibiotics. It probably involves several mutations that normally are difficult to accumulate at the same time in the same cell. Um, are you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay, um, good. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So yeah, I, I, thought that, I thought that maybe the, <laughs> I had made something wrong and I was just talking. Oh, no, you're not. No, okay, no, we're, we're riveted. I, yeah. If I can ask good. a question um, in please, between. Please, go ahead. So this um, um, robots, they um, recognize negatively charged uh, membranes, right? because they are positively charged and that's how they target? Or is there a more specific way of targeting really just bacteria and not other cells? Okay, so in this generation of uh, molecular machines, we do believe it's a passive targeting. And what we saw is that the most potent antibacterial molecules were in fact the positively charged ones. And like you mentioned, they're possibly bind through a passive mechanism, potentially by electrostatic interactions with the surface of the bacteria, which is negatively charged. So this is something that we're going to be focused on future work, is the ability to target specific pathogens, for instance, right? Because in our body, we know that we have good bacteria. Not all bacteria are bad. So it would be great if you could just target our technology to kill the ones that are causing disease without affecting the others. But yes, current technology is passive charge. Yeah, but also regular membranes are negatively charged, right? Of regular cells, like arresting potential uh, membranes are negative usually. In the case of the bacteria, uh, they are negatively charged. In case of mammalian, they are zwitterionic. Zwitterionic, how do you say that word? Zwitterionic, uh, which means they are neutral. And that's why. Well, no, not neurons and so on. Like a lot of cells are negatively charged. They have a positive uh, charge inside, and then, uh, you know, inside the membrane, it's usually high K plus. But then, you know, the charge is from the outside is negative, no? So in, our, in the case of bacteria, we know they are attracted to the negatively charged phospholipids of the membrane. 
specifically cardiolipin, phosphatidylglycerol. I, I'm not sure about the charge of the phospholipids of the plasma membrane of mammalian cells. I think that is generally, so that's what the literature says, that in general, mammalian cells, the surface charge is neutral. But uh, I, like I said, I know more about bacteria. I'm not sure about mammalian cells. Will you, may I ask a question, please, Anna? Sure, sure. Will, will you be discussing the mechanism by which the nanoparticles kill the bacteria? A little bit, Okay, thank yes. you. I'll be patient. <laughs> okay, so I should, can I, can I? Please please? continue. The floor is yours. Go ahead, go, go ahead and, and interrupt at any time. So, yes, yeah, so, like I was saying, throughout our um, repeated exposure experiments, we did not see uh, a development of resistance to the, the microbial uh, nanomachines, which kinds of kind of gives us an idea that the mechanism is probably something that the bacteria cannot easily resolve. So for instance, the fact that we did not see development of resistance suggests that it's not one single process. Otherwise, bacteria would rapidly, could rapidly acquire a mutation and develop resistance to the uh, antimicrobial um, molecular machine. But of course, we needed to find out what is happening. And the first thing we did was to do a transcriptomic analysis. So we look at the genes or the transcripts more specifically, that were changed in bacteria exposed to uh, the molecular machine and in those that were exposed to our vehicle, TMSO, under the same irradiation conditions. So the only thing that changes is the presence of the molecular machine. And the interesting thing that we saw was that the genes most affect, or the transcripts most affected by our treatment were related to processes involving the plasma membrane of the bacteria. So the top genes were all associated with the respiratory chain. The, uh, and the electron transfer uh, complexes, complexes of the membrane. So that was a big clue that something happening, something was happening at the level of the membrane. And when we look at the bacteria under the microscope, we could clearly see something was really happening. As you see on slide 13, the molecular machines caused a major disruption to the cell. And in the case of scanning electron microscopy photographs, we actually even saw something very peculiar, with what, which was some sort of holes in the membrane. And the cells kind of look like deflated. Let's imagine a football and you, you just punched the football and it, the cell is all deflated and shrunken, which all points to the membrane as being the big target of molecular machines, <coughs> which led us to another question. So um, should I provide more detail into other experiments that support that the membrane is the target. Would you guys like to hear more about that? Oh, I personally would. That's, this, is, this is absolutely fascinating. Yes, please. Okay, so this is, uh, the photos were very clear to us that the membrane was being targeted. The RNA-seq was also very clear and persuasive evidence that the membrane was being targeted. But we did some additional experiments that I did not include in the, the slides, but I will go through them very quickly because I love to talk about the work that I do. So um, what we did to verify that the membrane was being disrupted was to look at the fluorescence of certain markers of the integrity of the membrane. So if you look in slide, let me see, in slide 14. We're, we're losing your volume. Uh, could you move closer to your microphone, please? Okay. 
So can you hear me? Much, much better. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm gesticulating in the room by myself and the microphone is going away. I'm sorry. I'm getting too excited. You, ha you have, to hold, so, your, you have uh, to hold your hands closer to the microphone. Yes, I'm going to try. So on slide 14, you can see a uh, um, distinction between the two main groups of bacteria, which are the gram-positive bacteria and the gram-negative bacteria. And when we talk about developing new antibiotics to fight antibiotic resistance, gram-negative bacteria are particularly important, but also particularly challenging to deal with because they have not one membrane, but two. So it's a double shield that protects them from, uh, for instance, antibiotics. And their outer membrane is also very hard to deal with from the antibiotic perspective because it is uh, negatively charged, so it repels big antibiotics that try to get in. And on the other hand, antibiotics that normally kill gram-positive bacteria, they cannot get through the double membrane of the gram-negative. So we have a bunch of antibiotics that are useful for gram-positive, but just completely useless for gram-negative. So to find out whether the molecular machines were passing the double membrane of the gram-negative, we looked at fluorescent markers of the integrity of the outer membrane of the bacteria and of the inner membrane. To look for the integrity of the outer membrane, we used a fluorescent, a fluorescent uh, called NPN that only fluoresces or whose fluorescence is increased when the membrane is disrupted and that it was exactly what we saw. So I'm looking now at the paper, figure five, panel A. And then to check if the membrane also permeabilized the inner, if the molecular machine also permeabilized the inner membrane of the cell, we looked at this very famous dye, propidium iodide, that in bacteria can only enter the cell when the inner membrane is compromised. In, as we can see in the paper in figure 5b, we also saw a big increase in PI fluorescence with increasing concentration of nanomachine, which gives us more evidence that in fact the nanomachine is disrupting both the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the bacteria. And in can I can I ahead. just ask, please, um, how is the nanobots getting through there? Is it like a, a tiny little drill, or are they just digging through? Right. Or? Okay, very good question. So, <laughs> uh, the nano the nano machines are composed of two parts: a stator and a rotor. So, if you look in the paper, I'm very sorry that I did not put this figure in the presentation, but in the paper, on Figure One, you will see a schematic representation of the nanomachine. So we have a rotor and a stator. In the presence of light, the molecule undergoes a conformational change which makes the rotor go around the central axle of the molecule, which makes it kind of drill. It makes a drilling motion, a 360 degree drilling motion that we suppose propels the molecule through, for instance, a membrane or through wherever it is. So that's the, that's the uh, mechanism that we hypothesize. That is so cool. Thank you. <laughs> it is very, very cool. You're very welcome. So uh, like I was saying, we can see that using these fluorescent markers of the integrity of the membranes of the bacteria, we could in fact see that the molecule was permeabilizing both membranes and another evidence of the destruction of the integrity of the membrane is that we start seeing increasing concentrations of molecules that are normally inside the cell coming out. So for instance, we saw a big jump 
in the levels of ATP that were being detected outside the cell. So when we pelleted the cells and collected the supernatant, we had a big increase in the amount of extracellular ATP, which is also an indication of the, that the integrity of the membrane has been compromised. So what we did next was, based on these abilities of the nanomachines to disrupt the integrity of the membrane, we started thinking, okay, so if the membrane of the gram-negative bacteria is so challenging for antibiotics to cross, maybe if we punch it a little bit with our nanomachine, just a little bit, not enough to kill it, but just punch it, and then apply an antibiotic, will we be able to get that antibiotic from the outside to the inside? And maybe we can repurpose some of those useless gram-positive antibiotics now to kill gram-negative cells. That was our thought. So we had to give it a shot. And what we saw was that when we pre-treated our cells with a molecular nanomachine, at sublethal levels, so just a little bit, not enough to kill it, just to punch it a little bit, just a little bit of a prick to see if the antibiotic could go inside easy, easy, more easily. What we saw is that in general, cells that were pre-treated with our molecular machine became more sensitive to antibiotics. And what we also saw was that when we measured the fluorescence of antibiotics inside the cell. So I'm looking at slide 15, panel C. We see that cells that were pre-treated with nanomachine accumulated more antibiotic inside of them. So we were able to permeabilize the cell enough to get more antibiotic to accumulate inside it. So. Um. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm uh, just going to think. Uh, may I ask, um, if they can go in there and puncture this membrane, why? What would be the benefit of allowing the antibiotics? Like, and if the robot's there, why not just have them wipe it out? Or is that okay. exposing it to other risks? So, um, this is a way, for instance, to extend the lifespan of our conventional antibiotics if we can use it in combination with other antimicrobials, because our antibiotics are really, really good and really safe. But the problem is that if we just use them by themselves, bacteria will develop resistance. But if we can combine, make a combination that the bacteria cannot easily develop res resistance to, because remember, the nanomachines have a multitude of targets. They cause massive disruption, massive havoc inside the cell. While antibiotics, they normally just have one tiny target that bacteria can easily develop a resistance to by a mutation or a couple of them. So that's one of the advantages. Another issue is that, uh, as we see, we'll see in a couple of slides, these nanomachines, they also kill mammalian cells very effectively. So we, we are using these nanomachines also to kill cancer cells very effectively. So if we combine a little bit of antibiotic, a little bit of nanomachine, we can achieve a, ther a therapy that has the beneficial of being safe and preserving the viability of our conventional antibiotics by mitigating the emergence of resistance. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense now. So the um, the nanobots set it up and the antibiotics exactly. knock it down. Exactly. That way it exactly. could be more targeted and it can't develop easily to that because it's, they're not sophisticated enough to understand such complex um, strategies on it. Thank you very, very much. That's incredibly interesting. It is very interesting. So what we did next was we wanted to set up set up a real big challenge for ourselves. And that challenge is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And this is a bacteria that is very, very, very resistant to a wide range of antibiotics because it has a very impermeable outer membrane. It has something really 
problematic uh, on top of that, which is the presence of a bunch of efflux pumps. So the antibiotic, even if it's able to enter, these efflux pumps rapidly pump out the antibiotic so it doesn't exert its toxic effect inside the cell. So we said to ourselves, okay, so far so good. We've been able to kill E. coli, which it's very easy to kill, but let, let's try a really big challenge, which is to try to permeabilize this nasty Pseudomonas aeruginosa to an antibiotic that usually does nothing to it because it's so big. It's called vancomycin, which is normally antibiotic used for gram-positive because if you look at the, the, the molecule on slide 16, this thing is huge. No way it's gonna cross the outer membrane of a gram-negative, right? But we have a little trick up our sleeves, which is called molecular nanomachines. And what we saw is that when we pre-treated our cells with our molecular nanomachine, again, at sublethal levels, we don't wanna kill it, we just wanna punch it a little bit. So it, the, per, the, the outer membrane becomes a little bit more permeable. We were able to get this huge antibiotic inside the cell and in combination kill Pseudomonas aeruginosa, no problem within an hour, an hour and a half. So this was really huge for us. Now, the next thing was to check if this thing works in vivo. So very promising results in vitro, but let's face it, it's very easy to kill bacteria in a Petri dish. What about inside an organism? But the first thing we had to do was to check if, check if it was safe. Uh, for for mammalian cells because like I said uh, in the back of my mind is the fact that we have been using the things to kill cancer cells and they do it very well and what we saw is that I'm looking at table 2 on slide 17 now as we can see the IC50 that is the concentration that inhibits the growth of mammalian cells by 50% it's fairly close to the, the one that is necessary to inhibit bacteria. So if we calculate the ratio between the IC50 and the MIC, we get a value of two. So a therapeutic index of two at best, in the case of Acinetobacter balmani. So uh, this is not great news. It means that the concentration that is needed for to kill bacteria is close to that that inhibits mammalian cells, but it's far enough that we can try it in an animal and see what happens. Because sometimes in vivo, it doesn't. It it's not the only determinant factor for success of a therapy. There are other variables that can interfere with with the success of the therapy. In, in our case, we are tar targeting surface wounds, particularly burn wounds, where most of the mammalian cell is already dead. So if we kill or if we damage a little bit of the tissue, it's not gonna be a big issue because the benefit that we'll have from the therapy is gonna outweigh the the limitations, but this is something that we have in mind and we are working towards solving. So, and like I said, there is some uh, degree of selectivity towards bacteria compared to mammalian cells, which we attribute to the differences in charge of the, the bacterial cell, which is mostly negatively charged. And our, uh, Molecular machines, they are uh, positively charged at physiological pH and therefore attracted to the bacteria, preferentially then to the mammalian cells, which in general are considered to have a neg uh, neutral surface charge. So now I'm on slide 18. What we did was to do a little bit of um, thinking and we thought that it was probably not best at this 
moment to move to mice since we had these safety concerns. But we did uh, find a suitable animal model, which is called Galleria melanella, which is a worm that obviously has differences from the immune system of mammalian cells, but it has also some similarities, so much so that uh, the, the type of immune responses elicited by antimicrobials in these worms mimic those elicited by the same antimicrobial in mice. So these are well-established models for preclinical uh, antibiotic development, and that's what we went for. And they are also very easy to manipulate. They are very cheap. They are very easy to maintain. And there are no ethical uh, reservations since they are invertebrates. Anyway, we always try to minimize suffering of the animals in case there was emolif leakage, for instance. We made sure that we weren't gratuitously exposing the animals to unnecessary harm. And they served a very good and beneficial purpose, which was to show that, in fact, in this simple infection model, when we infected the worms with two types of bacteria, a gram-positive and a gram-negative, we did see that our na uh, nanomachines mitigated the mortality associated with the infection, which is very positive news to move forward to uh, um, a mice model of infection in the future as soon as we can make these molecules a little bit more selective towards bacteria instead of mammalian cells. So we need to work a little bit on improving the therapeutic uh, profile of these molecules, which is something that we are uh, thinking very hard how to do. So I am concluding at this moment. You guys have any questions? Uh, yeah, so uh, the light wave is 405 nanometers, mm -hmm. and you need um, how many milliwatts again? 140 something. Yes. Uh, so is that so do you need to give a continuous pulse for them to perform this? Is this just a millisecond or so? Like how long do you need to shine so this light on? In our experiments, we typically used five minutes of irradiation. And that was enough to knock down, uh, at the power that we were using, that was enough to knock down the, um, the cells. In the case of the worms, we also did five minutes of treatment and we saw that that was enough to mitigate the mortality associated with it. So wouldn't that light by itself already kill the cells? Good question. So that's why we, we did the DMSO controls with the light alone because we know that blue light alone has uh, antimicrobial effects. But under the conditions that we used, for instance, if I'm looking at um, slide 18 panel B, we can see that cells that were treated with 1% uh, DMSO, the survival rate of those guys was much lower than those cells that were treated with a nanomachine. So this way we are sure that what we are seeing is a result of the nanomachine and not just light alone. But that is a very good question. And in effect, one of our hypotheses to explain um, the, the observation that we could not detect development of resistance is that we are compounding here the effects of multi-antimicrobial uh, modalities at the same time. We have a little bit of blue light, we have the nanomachine, so it can also be a combination of, of those, but to assure that the effects that we are seeing are due to the nanomachine, we always did our controls just with DMSO plus the same exact irradiation. So, but if you would need to do this in a living organism, this is a lot of light, right? Um, it's probably pretty damaging. So, can you, is there, are you planning to develop a method where you can just trigger it with light and then the, the, the nanomachines keep performing this for, for some time? I know you need a limit for them to not go rogue basically mm -hmm. but um, that would be because 
just the light itself would be damaging and then also how how are you going to use this in tissue that's further in in the body very very interesting questions very important food for thought too yes so one of the limitations of the technology is that we are limited by the depth that the light can go into the tissue and this is 405 nanometer light it can only cross very it can only uh, go through the very top layer of the skin a couple of millimeters so what we are trying to do is to find molecules that can be activated by light that go can go deeper in the tissue for instance uh, near infrared light which can go much deeper so on the other hand uh, this light alone at 405 nanometers it's pretty damn close to the UV range anyway so that's another reason to try to move farther away from the from this wavelength but this is a proof of concept these nanomachines can be activated by visible light this is a, an advancement from the previous generation of nanomachines which were UV activated we are now working with visible light and we are able to very efficiently kill bacteria and we have promising results from in vivo work that is just I think that is very inspiring and very rewarding for us and tell us that this is something worth pursuing we need now to face that we have some limitations with the technology and try to to sort them and find solutions for it not only the light but also for instance the targeting of the pathogens specifically so it sounds like right now there's not an internal delivery system however maybe for surface infections um, such as MRSA and maybe mm -hmm. just a surface MRSA that this could be effective yes so um, we envision this technology at this point to be used mostly for surface infection burn wounds surgical wounds surgical infection sites because w I don't know if we are if you are aware but and I wasn't aware that uh, most treatments for burn wounds are very have very low um, efficacy because uh, if they involve the use of an <coughs> systemic antibiotics these can this cannot really get to a place such, a, such as a burn wound where there is there is so much tissue damage that the blood cannot get there so the amount of antibiotic that we get to our wound from systemic administration is very very low so it's very ineffective on the other hand uh, we have topical creams mostly based on silver for instance that are very high toxicity associated with them too and they impair the healing of the wound on top of that so we are very limited in our options so whatever option that we can come up with that can help solve the problem ca that can bring some more options to the table i think is worth investing because we are so limited but yes that's one of the limitations right now we can only use this type of light for surface infections right so maybe it could be used in conjunction with something else and yeah sadly i am very aware of the limitations of burn wound treatment um yeah thank you yeah i have another question do you have or are you planning to build a mechanism that kind of triggers them to disassemble or do they have a lifetime because now i'm just imagining if they mm -hmm. keep staying in the body you go into the light and you keep turning them off and on uh, like, are you working on having basically a disassemble? Because we had here a guest speaker from Japan earlier. He's also developing <coughs> these nanorobots that can transport and deliver things. Mm -hmm. And basically, he had one wavelength to where they kind of disassemble, and then one wavelength where they kind of deliver the stuff. So, So are you planning on doing something like that? So right now we know that the cells get rid of the nanomachine. So the cells are able to clear the nanomachine out of their system by their own. 
so we don't need to actively disengage the nano machine so right now we are not not considering a way to s disassemble them mostly because we are trying to move farther away from the UV as possible. So maybe the next stage we can have an, uh, a more limited um, wavelength that can only activate the nanomachine to kill the cells without the problem of the nanomachine staying in the system. The thing is that we also don't have much information about the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of these molecules. We don't know, for instance, how long they reside in the blood. How are they cleared out of the system? So this is very uh, preliminary work, very proof of con it's a proof of concept work that our idea functions and that is worth pursuing more. But we definitely have a lot of questions to answer. Yeah, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so I I wasn't able to follow the slides because I'm multitasking. I, I didn't see them. So forgive me if you cover this. But um, in the uh, oncology space, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of off-target toxicity for a lot of the uh, classical chemotherapeutic agents. And there's a whole line of therapeutics that are called bispecifics, where you have uh, the ability to bind to a particular cell based upon recognizing an antigen unique to the cancer cell and then attach to the other arm of the antibody a uh, radioactive substance or a um, chemically, biologically active substance so that you can target the drug specifically to those cells. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm wondering is how much research is being done with um, the uh, nanos and the uh, chemotherapeutic agents Mm -hmm. And is there is there potential for a tri-specific um, one that identifies the cancer cell, one that punches a hole in the cell membrane, and the third that introduces a toxic agent? Do you know of anything going on along those lines? So I know that my colleagues are working very hard with using these nanomachines to kill cancer cells, specifically melanoma, and they are looking into combination therapy. But I don't want to expand too much on that because it's unpublished work. But that is happening, and it's looking very promising. So that is something that you can maybe contact Dr. Turin. He will be able to provide the specifics privately because this is not published work. But yes, that is being done. I can speak from the microbiology perspective. So what we are trying to do is exactly to have a nanomachine that has, uh, let's say, a peptide addant that is specific to uh, a surface antigen of a, a MRSA, let's say. So the nanomachine binds to the, the cell that we are targeting, punches it a little bit, and then we can have the antibiotic going in. So that is something that we are also envisioning for the microbiology aspect of it. On the cancer side, there is also very promising work going on. But like could could you, that. would you mind sharing uh, the email address of the researcher you mentioned? So uh, Kat Katarina can probably give you that because Dr. Troy oh, okay. was a speaker a couple of weeks ago, right? He gave a yeah, talk. Yeah, he was a speaker here yeah. a little while ago. He's an amazing speaker, yeah. Okay, yeah, I yeah. can introduce you to to James if you yeah if please you would like. yeah I, I would I, yeah. I would really like to uh, engage thank you Jamie Dr Shah do you Anna do you still have a few minutes for I know we, it's already five minutes past <laughs> the time but um, 
Sure, go ahead. I Thank can, you. I can, I can talk. Could, could I ask one, one more quick? About my could I ask one more quick question? Go ahead, please. Yes. Yeah. So, um, for topical application like you described, burns and and so forth, um, this makes abundant sense. As I'm sure you're aware, as a microbiologist, um, the problem with these broad spectrum systemic antibiotics is you cause a mass extinction of the microbiome on every surface, which is really unhealthy for humans for a whole lot of reasons. Exactly. So. Um, having broad spectrum topically for burns um, is the classic way of um, preventing serious infection in, in burn patients, and it's really problematic. So that what you're doing is incredibly exciting in that space. My question is, are you beginning to see... So the fact that the broad spectrum implies that the mechanism of action uh, has to do with highly conserved properties of of bacteria. And so what what would be really, really interesting is if you were able to look into the phylogeny of those target sites among bacteria to see if there are minor variations that would allow you to better construct the bots to target much more restricted classes of bacteria to avoid the mass extinction that are caused by mm -hmm. the broad spectrum antibiotics, which are just really a bad idea, particularly in an era where we can do DNA sequencing mm -hmm. and, 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 and immediately within minutes know what bacteria it is. So the biggest, the biggest legitimate use for broad spectrum systemic antibiotics is in treating a sepsis when you don't, you haven't yet cultured the organism to know what you're targeting. So you target everything until you get the antibiogram back and then you try and narrow the coverage to just that organism as much as you possibly can. Um, so in that scenario, if you were able to, and but, but given that we can do the DNA sequencing and identify the bacterium very, very quickly now and target it initially with a more narrow spectrum uh, approach, do you, have, you, have you seen any suggestion that even in those highly conserved portions that there's enough variation uh, that there might be able, uh, the ability to restrict the class of bacteria targeted by individual uh, nanobots? Thanks. Okay, so two points. We have no evidence whatsoever that they target specific regions within the membrane or a specific protein. What we have evidence for is that it's totally untargeted. They bind by electrostatic interactions or hydrophobic interactions with the phospholipids of the membrane, which are present in bro both gram-positive and gram-negative, and they just disrupt the membrane by that. So we don't have the possibility of targeting specific phylogenetic groups that way. What we do have is the possibility of, by click chemistry, having a peptide addend that is specific to uh, a certain organism that we are targeting, a MRSA, uh, an epitope that we can make our nanomachine target and bind that bacteria specifically and then drill through the membrane of that bacteria. I don't think that we can, without an addend like this, or an aptamer, an antibody, a sugar, something like that, I don't think just the nanomachine, just by modifying it slightly, we can achieve that narrow spectrum of action. We can couple it with something el else that is going to target it to a pathogen of interest. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, that's very helpful. And do you do you have any preliminary data about crossing the blood-brain barrier? No data at all. We haven't even tried it with the nano machines. Uh, because, like we said, we are limited in terms of our light source. Uh, so, um, I don't know if, I mean, unless it's a case of life and death, 
who would want to have their brain open to have a light source up in there? So uh, uh, actually, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, photobiostimulation is is a whole area of uh, light therapy uh, oh, introduced. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm an advisor to one of the one of the uh, pioneers in that field, and so yeah, I, I just Google photobiostimulation, and mm -hmm. and um, you'll you'll find that there are a growing number of applications um, for synchronizing. Uh, brain cell activity, which has, oh, wow. which 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 can stimulate a meditative state or various other states, and and overcome a lot of um, cognitive impairment and so forth. So that's not out of the question. And then the other thing to look at is open water. Uh, Mary Lou Jepson, one of the mm -hmm. tech pioneers of our era, uh, and what she's doing, um, she's doing whole body imaging with uh, red spectrum light mm -hmm. and it's pretty remarkable uh, what's emerging out of that project she's done a couple of ted talks on it and um very very interesting so th there there may be some synergies between what you're doing and potentially photobiostimulation and uh, the open water project so uh, i would take a look at those definitely very interesting i was not aware of that um, can I ask as well? Um, this is this is absolutely remarkable work and quite actually ingenious. And I can see that this requires like a lot more ex exploration um, because you're going to be very very careful, obviously, with something like this. And um, my question was, and if I'm getting the understanding of how these are working wrong, forgive me. Um, but the little um, nano machines, uh, I wondered, could you? have something like giving them like put you know when you put in the amount of nano machines one of them is like a a queen machine that can like emit the light by itself to make the the oh, other wow. like drones that is an amazing topic of work i was just reading about this <laughs> oh that cool. is absolutely i don't know well i don't know about the nano machines but your concept is absolutely possible and it is being actively researched right now so <laughs> this is a very interesting thing so we have what are called transducers and this has been used in the photodynamic therapy space so if you are not familiar photodynamic therapy uses light to activate a molecule that is called a photosensitizer that when is excited by light emits reactive oxygen species that can kill bacteria or most normally cancer cells. This is an approved treatment for certain types of cancers. The current photosensitizers is that they are also very limited by the light that they absorb. Many are still UV active, which is obviously a limitation because UV is dangerous, obviously, and also limits the depth of the therapy, right? If we have a UV source, it can only go so deep in the skin, very little, it's only to the surface of the skin. So there are in fact what are called transducers that are used in the same treatment with the photosensitizer. It, and what they do is that, let's say they absorbed light in the near infrared and transduce it to UV radiation that can activate the UV sensitive photosensitizer, you see? So, and we also have what are called up conversion nanoparticles, for instance, this is a very interesting topic as well, that do a similar thing. They are, they are able to absorb a light source and convert it to photons of another type that are gonna be able to activate the molecule. So let's imagine that we have, for instance, our nanomachine is administered, let's say, to the, the gut. Let's imagine to a, the exophagus or to a colon uh, where we want to treat some infection, whatever infection. And at the same time, with the nanomachine, we administer these conversion or transducer nanoparticles that are able to absorb 
light in the near IR that can ca penetrate deep in the tissue and convert it into energy that is around the 405 nanometer light that is necessary to activate our nanomachine. So this concept oh. is very being very actively researched. This is something that I'm very interested in as well because it is a ba major limitation of these types of nanomachines and mostly is being very investigated for photodynamic therapy, definitely. But that's a, if you just came up with that, that is genius yeah, because I, that I is just, being a research. <laughs> I just came up with that as you were just, as you were describing the thing, I was just thinking about like, um, um, what do you call it? Compartmentalization of uh, of, of tasks. So, mm -hmm. And the, the the two other ideas that I had uh, that came to me while you were discussing this is one of them is could you have um, again either either the one that activates light uh, or maybe all of them uh, instead being activated by sound like something inside mm -hmm. the machine that like a high um, frequency could that way you could do, 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 and yes. that is how you would control them. Because that could go through people easily and not yes, be as absolutely. Uh, and, and the magnetic mm -hmm. magnetic radiation as well, right? Ah. Crosses very easily through people's body. It's just more. Uh, like I said, light is good because it's non-invasive. It's easily controllable. Magnetic radiation is harder. Ultrasound, I'm not just so sure about the ability to focus to a certain spot, but I'm sure that it's being researched as well. And the, the other one I, I thought there was when you mentioned about the, the nano machines, they don't really target anything. You don't, you don't really have that. Uh, it's not really doing that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, with, I wondered if it would be possible you send in like one other batch of nanobots, but what they could do is if they could, you could put them to an area where there was bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, some some kind of way to take it and mark this area mm -hmm. so that when the actual destruction bots come in, they only go to the marked area. Very interesting I, thought. So you just uh, talked about the concept of uh, theranostics, right? It's the ability to diagnose and treat at the same time. That is very trendy as well. I'm, it's something that I'm also very well, interested in. <laughs> believe, believe it or not, one of the reason why I was even thinking of this idea was um, as you were talking, I imagined um, yeah, you know, the old, uh, when you, people would target trees to cut them down in forests and stuff, you get, mm -hmm. you pay, people get paid for summer jobs to just go and put X's on the trees that are taken. You know, yes. um, I re that that was really my was my thinking was your problem was targeting, but it's like what stops you from putting in something that can somehow mark them and target them so that that means when the the heavy mob come in, um, mm -hmm. that you're not worried that they're going to like run rampant. Instead, the that yeah, that was my <laughs> you're giving me way too much credit for my idea. Um, no, but, but thank I. You. I well, maybe you're a genius. You're giving yourself too little credit. Yes, that is the topic of theranostics. So uh, theranostic nanoparticles, they can be used two at the same time. Diagnose an infection, let's say. They bind specifically to certain elements associated with an infection, for instance. When a tissue is infected, there are virulence factors that are released. There are bacterial enzymes that are released there are uh, that identify the place as being okay there's an infection here this is abnormal and then those same factors can be used to activate the nanomaterial to exert its action for instance uh, this is used for um, drug delivery where you have a liposome that contains an antibiotic inside and in contact with these virulence factors or infection associated enzymes are degraded by the infection and release the antibiotic to the place. We can envision something like that to target our nanomachines to the infection site. Yes, that is a good idea. I don't know in practice, in practice how we would do it, but it, that is a very interesting concept. 
Thank you very oh, thank, much. Thank, thank you, you so me. much. I saw Dr. Shaw. I saw you flashing your mic. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, you so much, question? Victoria. Yes, and Anna, that was absolutely fascinating work. So my question, I'm just trying to be very short about the visible light activation and using of the nitrogen group because we know that it just impacting the configuration for the nano machine and i was just wondering to have further information around that because specifically when we are adding the nitrogen uh, for the two more i mean environment it it can impacting that so i was just wondering if you have further information around that i would be happy to hear it so can you please repeat it uh i your sound was a little bit cut off from my yes, heart. Yes, it's about the visible light activation. So I was just first of all wondering that did you came up with adding any kind of nitrogen group? Because mm -hmm. it just gives this ability to, I mean, yes. doing have an impact on configuration of the machine and have a better association actually between the amine group yes. of the machine so. and bacteria. Absolutely. The first time we saw that these uh, amine groups were being really, really efficient at killing bacteria, at binding bacteria and then killing it, we started looking into adding more and more and more amine groups. The thing is that we found that there is a compromise between the number of positive charges in the molecule and its size. So we started adding so many nitrogens that we thought, okay, this is going to be a super killer. In fact, the molecule became so big that it had a hard time interacting with bacteria. So it was not efficient at killing at all. So, um, but this is how science evolves, right? Incremental steps, one step forward, two steps back, but we eventually Absolutely. start moving somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we absolutely looked into adding a bunch more nitrogens, but it didn't work as we planned. I see. I think that was very, I mean, important part, especially when we want to just move to the, I mean, immunotropy and oncology part. Mm -hmm. It can, has an impact to the tumor environment. That's why so I asked that. I'm I'm talking just based on the microbiology. I don't know if, for instance, that made a bigger impact on that cancer part of the group. But like I said, if you contact Dr. Turi, he'll be able to provide you all the all the details on the cancer uh, part of the group. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we've been going on for a while. Um, uh, Dennis, did you have another question? If not, I'll have another, you know, one more, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak or Gilbert. Thank you, Katerina. Yes, Dr. Santos, that was a really fascinating uh, presentation. I have lots of questions, but we are short on time, so I'm going to keep them very focused. I was curious what happens. One, it's very cool that this is like ultra low molecular weight intervention like mm -hmm. um and that allows for all sorts of different mechanisms of action so i was curious what happens after their work is complete are there side effects um has there been any observation of immune response to the nanoparticles um, obviously we touched a little bit on the risk of malfunctioning mm -hmm. and how long are the specimens retained before disposal and how are they disposed of like in the case of the moth or the worm, rather. So, what I can talk about the in terms of the dis disposal of the molecule by the cells, we know that, for instance, the molecule binds stably to the membranes of bacteria, and after uh, 24 hours after incubation with the molecule in the dark, the bacteria looks perfectly fine one would say okay the molecule is gone but no if we radiate the the bacteria they are still killed as efficiently as if we had put fresh molecule on them so that is the observation for bacteria the molecule binds stably without any overt side effects to the bacteria in terms of growth or death and can be still activated 24 hours after it was initially added to the bacteria. In the case of 
uh, mammalian cells. The information that we have um, is from the work that was published by the group in 2019 with cancer cells. What they saw is that within 22 to 23 hours, the cells get rid of the molecule. They just expel it from the inside and they are no longer killed by them. So they, the molecule is able to get rid of the, um, the um, cells are able to get rid of the molecule by themselves, by clearance mechanisms. So it takes 24 hours for the cell to kick these bots out. That's funny. Yes, about 22 to 24 hours. Yes, that is published work. That um, It's a paper in ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces by the group that they, they tested exactly this in cancer cells. Fascinating. So I guess that, I mean, we still have to wait for the data to be published or for the experiments to be run regarding the extracellular activity, you know, if they end up in metabolites or if they can be, you know, end up in the soil through excretion or something of that nature. That is a very good point. We don't have data at this moment about that because like like we said we are trying to move away from from the 405 nanometer light trying to go to wavelengths further away from the uv so and if we get a system working at those wavelengths we will definitely do those sorts of um, research in terms of the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics of the molecule, elimination, because that, that would be interesting even to, to set up a therapeutic uh, regimen, right? Because if we don't have that information, we don't know if it's a concentration-dependent molecule, if it's a time-dependent killing, uh, which is going to influence the, the therapeutic regime, right? Is there a self-destruct function or perhaps do they degrade outside of the body, understanding that they can be reactivated? Um, sounds like so perpetually. Mm, mm, I, I don't have evidence to say that it's perpetually. I, I have evidence to say that I can treat my bacteria with the molecule for 24 hours and compare a bacteria treated with the molecule that same moment, they kill the same way. But they do degrade, for instance, uh, with light. If I leave the molecules on the bench, they degrade with time. They no longer kill as efficiently. And even uh, we have to be very careful when we store the molecules. We don't have, we don't want to have um, a lot of light exposure during the preservation of the molecules because they are light sensitive and they, they do degrade with with light eventually yes does that mean that because it's two mechanical parts does that mean that the mechanics no longer work or they disintegrate or like could we quantify sort of or qualify the degradation beyond performance the data that i have is in terms of performance in terms of the chemistry of it we know that during our irradiation treatment, they, they, they are not degraded with five minutes of irradiation. With ambient light, they probably degrade. I don't have information about the rate of degradation. I don't know if they decompose into two parts. We really don't have that. We, we mostly have focused on performance. For uh, understandable, I'm definitely looking forward to some of the the results on those questions I asked. Thank you so much for your Thank presentation you. and your time. Questions. Thank you, um, Gilbert. I wanted you didn't speak yet. I wanted to check in if you have a question or wanted to say something. Uh, okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had one last question because we had yesterday here Dan uh, Congreve. Uh, he's a professor at Stanford University uh, in the engineering department. He's developing a new system for 3D printing. We can basically focus blue light um, 
in the middle of um you know quite focused and even a shape that you can instantly basically 3d print let's say a little ship or something mm -hmm. and the resin doesn't have to stay in the liquid so maybe his um technology to project into deeper um you know constructs 3d constructs mm -hmm. uh very dense light that can 3d print almost instantly would be maybe a cool thing to collaborate with him on so you can focus the light into deeper tissues um quite well so maybe you could interesting yeah and it's blue light yes exactly so he developed a way that um the only light that reaches the deeper um, parts is blue and red light gets reflected so yeah it's really cool if you want i can or i Definitely. can send you at least the presentation you can look at it and if you're interested you know i can i can connect you it would be really cool and he's a really nice guy he, he, he is really great so it would be fun maybe to collaborate great thank you so much for taking the time for making the account i know you know i know you you came <laughs> nevertheless although you don't you know you, you said you don't like social media but i appreciate it and no, it was a great honor time. so i love to talk about my work um uh, so any chance i have to i i jump for it unfortunately there was a bit of tech involved which i don't like but uh, i got through it if i can do experiments complex biological experiments i can manage uh what's the name of this app uh clubhouse, clubhouse. yes <laughs> definitely for yes. sure and you did <laughs> i did it i did it Perfect. So ne next time it will be easier hopefully yeah, everything was perfect. I mean, you know, you did the advanced stage with uh, sharing a presentation and everything, you know, it's good. All good. Perfect. And well, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for caring about what we do and caring about the topic. And hopefully uh, this will inspire more people into working into in, in fighting antibiotic resistance, finding new tools to find fight antibiotic resistance because this is really the next pandemic that we have all been uh, kind of blind to see but it's coming for us so yeah. I'm ending on a down note but uh, we're fighting we're fighting <laughs> yes. we're doing our part <laughs> yeah yeah do? it's 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 wonderful that you're working on this and uh, we had here Dr. Mavidu uh, she's uh, I forgot, I think in Chicago, she also works on antibiotic resistance and she told us a little bit of that it's actually there's more funding for developing tools right now than funding for starting a company to then use the tools. Like mm -hmm. apparently there's almost no funding in pharmaceuticals, really not too much interested in because regular antibiotics are just so cheap and that's what most people buy still um so it's a very niche still thing for yeah, i companies. think that it's just um it's starting to change though we are starting to see people and more people dying from infections that used to be treatable right there used to be antibiotics that could treat them but the antibiotics no longer work. So we should really, really start to open our eyes to this problem. And this is not only from a research perspective, but it's like, it should be a community um, awareness of the problem because we also have a part to play in it. So I don't know uh, how it is on the US, but for instance, I know that in some countries, People can buy antibiotics without prescriptions, which is not good. That is making the problem worse. I know that I, I went to the pharmacy to get an antibiotic for my cat, and I didn't need a prescription, and then I can just throw the antibiotic in the garbage, which is not good, right? So any chance I have to make, to raise awareness of the, uh, about the problem, 
uh, I'll take that chance anytime. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Thank you. What a wonderful um, finish of the week. <laughs> that was our last talk this week. I'll be finally on some vacation the next week. So we will have a less dense uh, program. Um, and I won't be um, also in the lab. So um, the next we have still a few rooms next week. So we'll have on Tuesday, Dr. Berner talking about helium levels rising as a byproduct of fossil fuel burning. Dr. Maldonado will be here on Wednesday talking about food addiction vulnerability uh, with um, screening uh, with um, mRNA signatures. And Dr. Spontag will be here um, also about talking about uh, disinfect self disinfecting anionic polymers um, to also fight germs and that will be our week next week so thank you so much anna and you. enjoy your weekend enjoy your summer have you a lot too. of fun what's what's your next position are you you said you're so, going uh, yes uh, in a couple of weeks i'm gonna i'm gonna go to spain to work a little bit there with hopefully some new molecules, some even better molecules. And I mean, we, we need to keep fighting. We need to keep fighting. We, we are done with one pandemic. There's another one coming and we need to gear up. So I'm, uh, I'm excited to do that. Wonderful. We cheer you on. We wish you all the grants. Thank you so much all the grants in the world <laughs> it's, uh, yeah we are thankful that people like you are working in your fields thank you so much thank, thank you. you very much dr santos for coming thank you so much thank you very much for having me bye-bye bye close bye. the room in three two one bye, bye.